Welcome back, everyone. I hope you got some sustenance in the minutes before the session. Welcome to Protecting the Breathing Lands of the People Summit. Uh, we have three communities here represented, and we're hoping for Sam Hunter to join us from Piawanek. We'll see if we can fit him in when he arrives. Uh, I imagine there's some technical difficulty there. We're honored today to be joined by uh, Kichimakuzik and Inuig, uh, Kishetchewan First Nation, and Attawapiskat First Nation. Before I uh, introduce our first speaker, I just want to also acknowledge that we have two receivers. You'll be seeing James Schneider and Connie O'Connor. James is the science lead for World Wildlife Fund, and he's also leading the carbon sampling within the Meshkegawak Territory with Meshkegawak Council. Connie is a freshwater scientist with WCS Canada, and she's also the lead of their research and conservation program for their Ontario Northern Boreal Program. So thank you both. The receivers today will be listening carefully and closely. There'll be a, a human face for our presenters, and they will be uh, getting your questions and um, they'll be selecting some questions to ask of our presenters. And don't worry if your question doesn't get answered, we will be, we promise to answer them all post-summit. So we're going to, uh, so that's what James and Connie are with us today, so thank you both. And for those that don't know what the reference is to the breathing lands, you will soon find out because of this presentation and the one after, but this is in reference to something I have heard from a long time ago from the elders of KI when they told us about the breathing lands and these are, the peatlands and the wetlands of the Hudson Bay Lowland, and they play a very important role in uh, regulating our climate. And so I thank the elders for, uh, uh, for, for sharing, uh, you know, they're very good messages, messengers. And so um, we need to use them more and help us, you know, share this with the planet. Um, our first speaker is Chief Donnie Morris from KI. We're so honored that you could join us, Donnie, and it looks like technology is on our side, so that's wonderful. And in case people don't know where Big Trout Lake is or Kitchimacousic and Inuit, that's about 2,000 kilometers as the crow flies from if you're in the Toronto area, which is actually further than Florida from Toronto. So um, Donnie is in Northwestern Ontario and uh, Chief Morris, thank you for coming and I'll hand it over to you. Okay, but it is expensive to fly here. <laughs> Cheaper to go to Florida. Mia, why you? Donnie Morse, Nishant Kass, Nogmaka, Nomak, Snemek, Subininok. Welcome, everybody. I'm Chief of Snemek, Subininok. In the English language, it's Big Trout Lake. But uh, as we all know, uh, we are gradually going back uh, using our language in a more uh, subtle way. And as uh, our colleague Anne Baggio mentioned, the peats and moss, this is something. Uh, that's been on our minds, uh, I guess, for some time. Like growing up as a kid, uh, we're always told uh, any debris uh, of wild animals, guts, fur, bones, and all that, we're always told to throw it into the Muskeg area because it is it, it is a living it, it is a, a living um, uh, the moss, the peat. With all the bacteria too, uh, it dissolves all those quickly. And also with uh, the emissions that we're hearing now, and uh, that's that's why she mentioned the elders. Uh, we, we did get a lot of uh, access to our elders, which a lot of us has uh, left this world. And uh, that's always one of the things they always told us is the muskeg and the peat uh, supposed to be looked after and the lands, the waters and rivers. And I think uh, moving forward in, in this era now, uh, we, we are taking it very seriously now uh, as to how we can look after our lands, uh, our water and river systems. So with that, uh, that's just a short, uh, short summary of uh, and this, uh, uh, and the land that we're trying to protect too. Uh, a lot of times people think uh, we're excluding the rest of the Canadians, the other communities, but in reality, it, it is not. Uh, we always uh, come at it from the angle. We're, we're trying to protect whatever we have for future, for future use. What that use will not be known until uh, as we move forward, but definitely uh, the land we're, we're trying to protect uh, is 
how, what role can we play as an Aboriginal community uh, in, in our area of Northwestern Ontario to play a role into protecting our planet too. So with that, uh, it's just a short, short comment uh, I, I have. Like I said, uh, I have a, uh, a department called Lands and Environment, uh, which everybody's kind of busy or off at this moment. So that's where I'll leave it at then. Okay, thank you, Chief Morris. We'll have to get some good questions at you then later in the session. Um, all right, so we will move on. Oh, well, Sam Hunter, I do not see Sam. We will put it out into the universe. Sam Hunter, Sam Hunter, Moccasin Highway. Um, so Sam, if you're, if you're hearing, if your ears are burning, log in and we'll get you on. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to go, we're going to hear from Jackie Hukama Witt on the Ottawa, from Ottawa, Ottawa Piscat First Nation about her uh, traditional family grounds. So we're honored to have you, Jackie, and um, take it away. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for allowing me to present today. Although I'm not an official person, <laughs> but it's good uh, to contribute like, um, also like from um, from the human side of you know interactions uh, my name is uh, Jackie Hokemau and I'm from Ottawa Biscuit Wajik Miswe Jackie Hokemau and Nandishina Hassan Egumaga Ottawa Biscuit Tehndoschin Meshkego Gnestamaga Apesto Ochipwe Nenike Hegok and Iteche Kiyoshi Achochikiok Martin Falls at Dehe. So mix man distan egumaga should um Marina Degaskin in my family genealogy in the future. So I was just explaining a bit that I'm um Mashkego Cree, but I'm also um half Ojibwe because there's relations like if you follow the genealogy like through Martin Falls, there's relations there from my father's side. And uh, but of course, with Indian Affairs uh, Act definition, it has divided up our nation and put us in compartments. But my grandmothers belong to other nations. But nonetheless, I'm called uh, I'm with Ottawa Biscuit First Nation. Uh, but I'll tell you more with my family ge genealogy, um, how it's not compatible with the Indian Act. Um, definition of my homeland. Okay, you can move. Slide. Slide. So for me, um, my spiritual name is a white feather woman. And uh, as the elder, when, when we did the ceremony, they explained to me like how symbolic white feather women is because in the center, there's um, left and right. You, it's a Basically, it's like a balancing role, and I've noticed in my life um, growing up, uh, it's been a lot of um, a challenge because I had to leave home to go to university, and um, and in there I, I went, I entered the academy to integrate my own indigenous knowledge, and and sometimes it wasn't easy because uh, scientists said, well. Um, it's not really knowledge, and, but I had to keep fighting and I had to find good uh, professors to help me push my thesis through the academia. And uh, so, so with the traditional people that I met in my life, um, they also told me that I'm from the polar bear clan and my helpers are goose and also um, to work closely with nature. And if you look at the left screen, you see a woman um, her arms are raised to the universe and there's a moon and it's shaped like a skirt. So an elder told me to always keep our fire burning. I guess she means the teachings of our ways. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, and the, so, and this, uh, the sharing of knowledge or how we gain our knowledge, uh, Ermine, um, an academic from Saskatchewan, uh, he also uh, says the same thing about how we access our knowledge. Like he's also saying that um, 
in Western academia, they have their knowledge in textbooks, library fil filled with lots of textbooks and knowledge. And he was saying, well, what about our knowledge, our indigenous knowledge, how we should coexist and be part of this uh, knowledge production so that we take part in uh, caring for the universe and nature, the, the ecology. Uh, and for me, like, uh, and he calls the, the universe of being, how we find ourselves within rather than outside. And for me, once uh, I was sitting back home at the river, I was sitting on a big rock and um, growing up, you have a lot of questions about life. And that's where I, um, it felt like uh, I found myself there when I was thinking of my, my elders and traditional teachers and my parents and my grandmothers. It was like, while I was sitting there, I could hear the, the, the teachings, the knowledge came to me to hang on to it. Although it seemed um, it didn't really count, but, but it had to be done. It was my way how it helped me. Okay, next slide. And here's uh, my family, that's Sarah Okimao, uh, my great grandmother. And on the right side is my grandfather, Philip, and my granny, Jane. And my grandfather, Philip, uh, he had relatives through Sarah from Martin Falls area. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is uh, how I gained access to my worldview. Uh, my mom on the left, she was an elder for me too, and she was a, a herbalist. And my dad there, he was a counselor, and he, he, he was also like a mediator, so I think that's how, how I learned to be who I am today by uh, him mentoring me when I was growing up. And then when there's conferences, um, he took part in conferences about the importance of water, protecting our animals and uh, the air, like basically everything in that life and earth is sacred. And, and there's also uh, James, he came to Arawapiskat when there was a meeting. So I was pleased to see him there. And there's my Auntie Mary Lou and George Katakwapa. They're both traditional teachers and they also um, express the same uh, philosophy about how we should look after our earth. Next slide. And this is why we do it. Like uh, you see, um, uh, Arawapiskat River, like uh, uh, for me, uh, where my parents originally grew up, it was called Atawapiskatish, uh, which now they call Makiti River, but originally it was called Atawapiskatish. That's what my dad told me what it was called. And right now with our drinking water in Atawapiskat, um, it's very toxic. There's a lot of THM in our drinking water from the tap water because of the source and mixing in with chlorine. And next slide, okay. And this is uh, uh, my, my brother, he went to visit my family's uh, traditional land and, the, and there's a grave of my grandfather there and other relatives that lived around the uh, Makati River at Tawabuskitish. Uh, and that's how it looks. I hope one day to visit that place. Okay, next slide. And, uh, and for me too, I was quite active, but it was not always easy when the beers were in Atawapiskat. Of course, they have their water discharge right on Atawapiskat River. Um, my, my late dad and his late friend Benoit, they were both elders. So one time they were going on a helicopter right to monitor the, the river. So they asked me and my husband Norbert to jump on and and come with our cameras and we thought oh what what's what are they up to and then we they took us they told the pilot to go around the beers victor mine and there and that's where we saw the open pit and we took video pictures and photographs and then we came to the site too and they told us can you please document this to show the world what the beers are doing to our river okay and that next slide 
And uh, so I'll just read this, like the First Nation perspective uh, that we all know, it's uh, about water. So what is the most life-sustaining gift of Mother Earth and is the interconnection among all living things. Water sustains us, flows between us, within us, and replenishes us. Water is the blood of Mother Earth and as such cleanses not only herself, but all living things. Water comes in many forms and needed for the health of Mother Earth and for our health. The sacred water element teaches us that we have great strength to transform even the tallest mountain when being soft, pliable, and flexible. Water gives us the spiritual teachings that we too flow into the great ocean at the end of our life journey. Water shapes the land and gives us the gifts of the rivers, lakes, ice, and oceans. Water is the home of many living things that contribute to the health and well-being of everything in the water. Okay, next slide. And here I heard about uh, about our women, women warriors that are protecting water, water's life. And uh, one of them, Shirley, she was at the, I met her at Trent when I did my studies at the Native Studies. And they shared the same message that we must protect our water and they did, some, and they did the sacred walk. And uh, Josephine now has passed away and uh, we want to remember her and we acknowledge her work and her spirit to continue the, to continue the race awareness about the water. Next slide. And then there's Don Martin. She's a scholar from Six Nation and she wrote a, a poem, a story. So basically, um, creation stories also share uh, uh, convey the message about the importance of water. Like when she talks about um, the sky woman, uh, when she originally came to the earth, before there was darkness, and, and when the sky woman was descending to the earth, when her father said, it's time to go. And uh, so, she, and at the earth, there was darkness, there was only water animals under the soil. So as she was descending, um, the, the water animals saw great light coming from the universe and they said, oh, at first they were scared and then they said, oh, we must help her before she lands. So every water animal went, went deep under and the one, only one who survived was the mascot. When he surfaced to the surface of the water, he had a little bit of soil in his claws. And from there, they put it on a turtle. And then the turtle, it, it kept growing and growing. And then the birds, when they saw the sky woman descending to earth, uh, they quickly went to her and they um, made her land on their backs and they gently put her on Turtle Island. Uh, so that's their creation story. And Sky Woman originally saw water when she was going down. So that's that's the story of the creation story and the poor importance of water. Next slide. And for us too, we have the same stories that we hear from our elders. They said there's guardians and we must protect our water. So we did the concert once, a theater with the, the youth from Adoapuska, and they each had a role to play. And they, it was a story about the guardians to protect our water of Adoapuska. Next slide. And, and for us too, like uh, when we have ceremonies or feasts, uh, we share like berries that we get from the land and the tea and the fish, the caribou, the moose, like everything is sacred. And we acknowledge this when we have ceremonies, how we're all interrelated to everything on earth and how it is important to us and that we must uh, protect it for future generations. And also, um, okay, next slide. And here, like uh, my parents, they were trained by the missionaries when they were in residential school. So my father, uh, he was farming in Arawapiska at Potato Island. So it, always, it was always fun to go there. My husband and I would go there to barbecue and cook for them while they were uh, sowing potato seeds, onions, carrots, and cabbage. Uh, and it was so fun uh, and there were so many elders there it was a community garden 
and and it was so healing to be there in nature and to hear them laugh and having fun driving a tractor and using the old antique uh, equipment uh, they would drag their seeds their potatoes to put them into the ground and that's my mom my late mom she was always happy to go there to harvest the uh, potatoes onions and that's my nephew he helped my dad do harvesting and now um, I'm learning myself to garden and, and it's such a amazing like what a, a seed it's so simple but it's so complex and how sacred it is using water to nurture it to feed it and and when you talk about the animals like um, the the peat we use that too for gardening and how important it is to for the seed to grow healthy to flourish you know it's so sacred and there's even um to as a fertilizer we're using um uh, a meat fertilizer but it's organic it's powdered and uh, now i'm learning that if i want to go home and i want to be organic i would boil all the bones from the caribou moose fish you know and then after you boil them they you let them dry and then you powder it and it becomes like a powder and then you put it on your soil when you for um for nitrogen and all these important um nutrients that are needed for the potatoes and stuff to grow and now my grandnieces i helped them we started up a garden in their backyard they're in the city of north bay so that's my grandniece uh, she's eight years old the twins they're learning how to garden Okay, I think we do one more slide and, and it's a song. Okay, can we move this one? How long have I known you, oh Canada? I've known you when the forests were mine. They gave me clothing, gave me meat. I've known you in the rivers and streams Where fish flashed and danced in the sun Where the water said, come and eat Of my abundance I have known you in the freedom of your winds But the freedom disappeared like the salmon Go mysteriously out to sea The hairy man came from the east Pressed me down till I couldn't breathe How do I know you now, oh Canada? in the sun Loaded water doesn't say come and eat of my deficiency God give me back the vigor of Indian With my surroundings let me fight Country will devise its constitution overnight. We will die if we surrender. Don't give up. Let us protect our creation. Our life depends on it. We must treat it with respect. Our Attawapiskut River is our last pristine in Northern Ontario where major development for heavy metals like nickel, etc., is to be extracted for the next 100 plus years. This area encompasses one of the largest carbon storage in the world. If we excavate, rape the earth, 
We will harm the air and the oxygen we breathe. The trees are the lungs of Mother Earth that sustains us with clean air. Humanity has to think why we have climate change. If we destroy Earth, we hurt ourselves and our future generation. How will I know you soon, O oh Canada? I know you when the forests are mine. They give me clothing, give me meat. I know you in your river and streams. Where fish flash and dance in the sun. But the water can say, come and eat of my abundance. I will know you in the freedom of your wind. I will know you in the freedom of your people. This country will devise its constitution overnight. Wajiek meets Shanatak Egomaga, meet the Pajaman, Omaga Teho Titehe, Giwetan, Kaishipa Matasia, Mashkego Hitehe, Kaishikiskin the Meg, Ewino Chisagano, Hantekis Chisi. Ich Espima ge wan he gano ani pano mage wan kamana ta ego maga moni ge abit si magun ko yes ego maga mona te ki kasi ne ge magun ne ne on ka ne ne tetemah ego shmaga kiste ne ta tauma aski ga ki mine tehmando ne se chikiske ne mah chikiske stoi hok ni ka ne tehe awas chiki bitch pamat chik win stemau ka abit stago men aski no. Winnish the Maga in New York, Winnish the Mouth, Cat Cabbage Stagoman and Nipino gives to me to such a nest to give to me in the Hurtic. Gustain of Tago no maski, I give me at the Hishemito. Egusamaga Gustay deta, Nestana Nagat Stay, Mingo is magging the tail. I will know you in the freedom of your wind. I will know you in the freedom of your people this country will devise its constitution overnight Yeah, so basically, uh, it was a song about uh, Canada, how it's now polluted, and um, about the forest, the waters, and um, and I think I leave it there in case I get uh, disconnected again. But I thank you again for letting me present, and um, thank you again, everybody. I leave it there, Anna. You're welcome, Jackie. Thank you. And we'll get that song out to the to the rest of the participants. Um, thank you for that. And sorry for your internet connections. But hang on for the end of the session. We'll hopefully have some questions. Okay. Um, Mr. Edward Sutherland, where are you? Let's try and line up Ed. All right. Edward? Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Edward okay. is with Kis Edward is with Kisechuan, and I am so glad that Edward could join us. And I also just want to acknowledge that um, COVID is hitting the coast pretty hard right now and Kasechuan is one of the communities. So I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge that and uh, hopefully people recover quickly. So um, welcome Ed, Edward and um, we'll get your slides up and then I'll advance them for you. All right, take it away, Ed. 
All right, my Jake Mr. Get the Tenek. Hello, all, everyone listening. I'm just uh, going to touch on uh, more like awareness, awareness to protect or to do conservation on the James Bay coast, like uh, Winnipeg, Katrina Bay, or Hudson Bay. Um, I grew up uh, along the James Bay where uh, it's called Manaunan. I grew up there. I grew up there and uh, spent a lot of time out in the bay and inland with my parents. Uh, for some reason, my parents didn't let me go to high school. They, they told me you have to learn here first or move on in life. And they told me I can learn English or advance to uh, go to school <clears throat> later. So I was, I was really grateful. I was really grateful to them. Now I understand what they say. They meant. They learned the way, they learned traditional language, the language. Uh, old Cree, they learned the old Cree way. And this is more like an awareness uh, presentation, like conservation for our future, our future for our children, our grandchildren, our homelands, for all of us, all of us together, as we come together as one, our homelands, our planet, for all of us human beings. That picture there on the slide, uh, that was me taking that photo with my brother and his uh, his friend. We were watching a polar bear chasing around uh, molten geese in James Bay. That was in July 2009. It was quite fascinating to watch uh, a polar bear hunting geese, which, which was not a surprise. We were, we were told from our fathers right before that uh, polar bears come inland and hunt while the ice was receding. So uh, I allowed, allowed down to the uh, breeding lands more like a lot to a breeding waters, which is good. All right, next slide. I want to focus on awareness on uh, Hudson Bay and James Bay coastal mudflats. Uh, I've been, I spent a lot of time here in my youth uh, with my dad, my late dad. And uh, the mudflats are very important for migratory birds any birds like waterfowl, ducks, geese, and also migratory birds that fly to the Arctic. They pass through here, feed, rest. And uh, also when the Thai waters come in, they rejuvenate, they rejuvenate uh, the food source when it goes out again. More like a, a plate coming in for them and going out. New, new uh, fish coming in, small fish, vegetation coming in rejuvenate uh, the, the mud floods. And there are thousands, uh, when I was young, we used to watch thousands of shorebirds, uh, uh, long-tailed long ducks, scubers, just flying along the coast. I used to sit with my dad, you know, telling me which bird is which, out in the rocks, while I was tied rolled in. Very interesting. And, uh, <clears throat> Erosion, erosion is uh, erosion is kind of uh, hindering or impacting the the mudflats because of the, all the mudslides that happen happening up uh, up the rivers, the mudslides, uh, erosion and uh, peatlands, and uh, all that debris or sediment comes to the bay and goes to the mudflats, which are very important. And also, this caused uh, Hindrance also impact on breeding lands for the geese. And also tide waters. Tide waters are more frequent now since, uh, since uh, more extreme weather is happening up north. Tide waters do happen without any, uh, uh, what do you call it, full moon, when there's a full moon. Even though there's no full moon, there's still uh, high tide waters because of high winds. And there's also disrupting the, is also uh, causing uh, erosion on sandbars, shorelines, altering uh, feeding habitats. And uh, the mudflats is very important. And I would like to uh, touch that and uh, make awareness to all people that this is a, uh, even though James Bay is not real, if you see there's nothing there, right? In our eyes anyway, 
from the humanized threat, us, but, but to the birds and fish, it's an oasis of survival, you know what I mean? The ice, everything that interconnects, but it's very important uh, for the waterfowl, wildlife, and uh, even fish. So uh, that's part of what I wanted to uh, you know, make awareness to the scientists, not at holders, elders. Elders know already, but that's where I get my teachings from. I've been working with elders for more, more than 25 years now, you know, studying with them in a different way, not like uh, university, but their knowledge, I study the, the uh, transfer of knowledge. And I have a lot of uh, knowledge from them. I thank, I thank them for that. Uh, so that's uh, <clears throat> the mud class, uh, very important. Uh, next slide. Go to uh, go to another one there, uh, Hudson Bay. Uh, yeah, that uh, you know what? No, it's supposed to be one there. No, it's supposed to see a net. Oh, uh, that's all I got. Um, all right. Ed. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, also, I just want to point out uh, Hudson Bay and James Bay is not for. Uh, traveling, right? It's not, I hear people, I hear uh, from people, individuals that's the use of word traveling, but uh, we do have harvest out in the bay. We harvest whitefish. We have it, uh, we have a trout, we harvest trout and occasion, Arctic trout, char, occasionally, not much, but they're around there. Uh, we so we say that, we say that when the tiger was in, my, my late father used to, and we do it every year. Uh, we set out now to be, uh, we, we put pegs, right, poles, and we put uh, like uh, what they do in Nova Scotia, like when they set out their gill nets in dry land, and as a tie gun, then the fish come feeding. So uh, we do harvest out in the bay, and uh, we, uh, we do that every year, every spring, every summer. And also is important for uh, waterfowl, molten waterfowl like these ducks. You can see, you can see if you if you uh, camp out in the bay where our Manaunan, where our uh, camp, uh, where my grand my grandparents used to uh, used to live, and we we still go there today. You can see a uh, lot of geese. The safaris you can see along the shores, ducks. And we we only take what we need, right? That's uh, that's where we taught. We taught not to take many, because uh, everything is uh, interconnected. That's uh, like a circle of life. And also, uh, we we did hunt seals and belugas way back. I used to see, when I was younger, about six years old. I used to see my dad, my late dad, hunt seals out in the bay. And what they use it for? Uh, what do they call them? Like the Inuit use. The boots, they're kind of waterproof, right? So that's what they use for, uh, and then they use it for rope, rope and uh, all kind of material. But the meat goes to, uh, we use, they use them for dog slate, dog slates, like dog slate uh, meat for food. The belugas, they use it for oil. When they, when they uh, put geese away, like a big, uh, like a storage place, do not, uh, do not, uh, do not, do not spoil right away. And uh, so that's, uh, there's more information as only a point, some points I'm making. And travel, we do a lot of travel out in the bay. Got travel by canoe, by dog sled. When my dad used to have two dogs, Used to travel there when I was young. And now they travel by snow machines and boat out in the bay. But uh, now today the ice is different. It's more like crystallized. It's not, it's not uh, hard as a long time ago. It's more like crystallized 
not be, uh, ice because it's uh, climate change, right? It's too, it's too warm to form form really hard like it used to be. It's more like crystallized and soggy. And uh, we used to used to uh, we used to uh, used to hunt down uh, not hunt down but uh, uh, seals, right? We used to chase after them. And how how fast they can move their, their breeding holes? That's a testament. <clears throat> Begomer, the they call it they call them Begomer and Cree breeding holes. And uh, one thing I learned from my parents and my grandparents is uh, the little medicinal medicine out in the bay to uh, gather. I seen my father gather it. I helped him out. It's very important to us. Uh, out in the James Bay area, he used to ca collect the medicinal medicine, seaweed, not seaweed, but in the Cree way, it's, it, they call them sasabina, right? That's what they use for medicinal medicine. And that's why it's important to protect or conservate that James Bay area and even Hudson Bay. So that, that. <clears throat> okay. Next slide. All right. I just want to point out some invasive species, not invasive, but certain species heading, coming, uh, coming uh, to our area, James Bay. Like uh, the small boat bass was called by, by a young man, David Wesley Jr., out in about 90 miles up river. Small boat bass is very uh, is very dangerous, not dangerous, but with in in uh, with would would uh, impact on uh, spawning spawning eggs or uh, young fish. That would that would be an impact if they, uh, I think they're multiplying, but. Had to be monitored, right? And the pelicans have been around for ten years now or more. Yeah, yeah, they do a lot of they do a lot of impact on the uh, the native fish, the white fish, the trout, uh, the, suck, the suckers, and then the, and I told her, oh, how, how would you call uh, the pelican? He said. Uh, I would call him Chachagio, you know, that's what he told me, Chachagio, because I guess uh, he heard it from a, a fellow elder. And, and I told him, why did you call him? Because the way they fly, he kind of, uh, the way they fly. The raccoon, it's another piece that would impact a, uh, uh, nesting birds, nesting waterfall. A hunter caught a, a trapper caught a raccoon about 2006. Uh, he caught in his, one of his martin traps in Kishachuan. And uh, he didn't, first he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a dog. And when he uh, finally he brought it to town and uh, it was a raccoon, which is uh, very far from, very, very far home for a raccoon. I don't know how he got there. We asked around, it's not a pet. <laughs> It was not a pet, so we asked around. No, no pets. Uh, the comrade, the comrade's been around again, probably, I don't know, 20 years. And they, uh, I believe they uh, nest in the Ga uh, Gamaski Straits, where they call no man's land, those little islands. They nest there now. I had a photograph from MNRF. They're nesting and breeding there. And the uh, comrades eat a lot of fish. So that will be an impact on a uh, large impact also on uh, native species. The vulture, turkey vulture, has been seen in Fort Severn. In Fort Severn, they've been, they have photographs. And uh, the concern of the vulture is uh, we know vultures eat, uh, feed on the carcasses and dead animals, but if, if they can't find uh, these up north, the concern is uh, would they turn to eggs, uh, goslings, ducklings, new species? Uh, would they would they adapt to it, right? And that's a concern. Uh, that's a concern the elders of. And all of these have to be monitored. 
And again, the flower, the blue, the purple uh, blue stripe, it's been, it's in the Arctic now. So I'm not really sure how it, but they say, they say that uh, it dry up, it dries up the wetlands. It's like it has, it uses a lot of water, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I was told, so. Yep. So I'm gonna move to, Okay, I'm going to speak on something. Uh, there's a, there's a, I've been doing some research and some things been, some things I've been, yeah, that's the one I was, uh, yeah, I've been doing some research and uh, I was doing some research and uh, there's some, uh, there's some development in the horizon uh, in James Bay, like wind power, wind power uh, alienations. Uh, from uh, Kakaspeni to Manaunan, they've been identified by wind power development. It's not development, but it's in their withdrawal stage, like claimed claims, their claims along the coast is for wind power. Uh, Manaunan is for uh, it's called No Man's Point, English in the map. <clears throat> it's about thirty miles uh, north from Cash Saskatchewan. Then there's another thing uh, regarding Ring of Fire. There were there were talk about uh, uh, low water seaport in Kakaspeni. They call it uh, they call it Kakishiminagan Creek. A low water end port to uh, to have a railroad rail uh, train track access to Musini. So that, that's that's a talk, but I don't know if they're going to continue to pursue it or. Is it feasible for them? We don't know. So, and another one that's been uh, brought to my attention when I was younger, it's uh, they wanted to close off uh, the two points of uh, James Bay, Hudson Bay. I mean, the two points of the west side of James Bay to the east, they want to dam it. They want to dam it up and they, they want to drain all the fresh water out to uh, Hudson Bay and all the Fresh water from the uh, rivers make fresh water, and they want then they want to defer defer that water to the states, freshwater states. Because right now, as we speak, that California is running really low on water, the big drought, and the dams, the Hoover Dam is really low, at the lowest. And I heard the news this morning, and they they'll uh, and the crops they cannot wet their crops, they cannot seed plant seeds yet because of extreme drought. And I think I think this this will be activated. I'm not sure, but it has to be uh, has to be looked at or monitored if, if they bring out big uh, bring it back to life or continue to pursue to pursue it. And the final slide. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is the watershed of uh, Port Albany River. Here's the watershed, I see the, the green the green area, the green shaded area. And you see all those yellow, uh, those yellow alienations on uh, the top uh, middle of the, the picture, that's uh, wind power that they uh, want to put or, uh, and that would affect a lot of migratory ports, migratory ports, I think, and, and other things. Because there's a lot of primary nesting areas and calving areas in that area, moose calving areas, a lot of uh, berries, well berries, and the watershed goes all the way to uh, Kashatran for Albany. And that's the area is even bigger. In our land use planning, we did it for nine years, and we 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 uh, develop it to the terms of reference, and we uh, we uh, we protected a lot of uh, grave sites. We protected 21 grave sites for drills, some uh, culture sites in our land in our land in our land use planning, which is uh, we we had funding from MNR. 
but uh, when uh, Ford pulled out the funding, we discontinued. And, and I was hoping, I said, if you wanted, uh, and, I, and, and I thought, if Ford went through the, we, we drove a bulldozer to the swamps, I hope he stays there. He said it in one he said in one conference, one time. So that's uh, that's a watershed of the uh, the Great uh, Lower Albany and Kashatchewan for Albany, which is called Kashatchewan in Cree. So next slide. It's my question. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miigwes. And questions? Kagwetjekemuna. This photo, this photo was taken from my brother. He he went moose hunting in Gabushkau and heading back to Kishatuan by tide waters in the bay. So there's a moose they got there. So had Thank a good you. meal that had a good meal that evening. So, <laughs> so Miguel, any questions? Thank you, Edward. Yeah. We'll um I think we may have Sam. So before I get Sam on the line, I'm just gonna just Oh, Sam is, okay, great. Well, Sam needs one minute. And while Sam is getting ready, Chief Morris, if I can um, just ask you a quick question. This morning, we talked a lot about decades in the making and um, people may not be familiar with your history, but that you were one of the KI6 that stood up to protect your ancestral lands years ago. Did you just wanna share a little bit about that while we're waiting for Sam? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the presentations, especially from Edward. Uh, as a kid growing up, I heard about that dam on the Hudson's Bay. And I think it really uh, scared our community members. Uh, even on Severn River, there was mention of 12 dams and there's a, at one time a Severn River coalition came up out of that, but I don't know where it went. But that's something uh, I guess has always been on, on our minds if there's a dam that's ever built up there, which will redirect our all our waters. So that's that's a signal itself that uh, as communities, even though we're inland, uh, we should support each other. So with us, uh, the KI-6, uh, as you all know, uh, we were jailed for contempt uh, for blocking two well, one major junior company, which was Platnix, and the other one was uh, God's Lake Resources up north. And uh, <clears throat> blocking them, uh, by that I mean not allowing them to uh, to uh, be on our lands, to do what they're intent to do, uh, their work. And one thing we, we did find out is uh, the bureaucrat system. Uh, when they say consultation, uh, that is something the, the system really goes against us. Because when we had had three ministers uh, visit us, one was on when the Indian Affairs Minister was first uh, bought out and the child agency minister. And I think there was a, another minister that visited. And for those uh, three minister visits were categorized as consultation in regards to platics which was not, not the real story, but that's what was put out in the media when uh, one time we were opening TV, uh, we saw the premier uh, saying uh, three of his ministers had gone to KI to discuss this, which was really, didn't really happen. And that really hurt us that time. So with, with the fact that being jailed, uh, I, I think it has moved us further down the line as to how we want to preserve our lands. Uh, even uh, we were threatened like to pay uh, $10 billion uh, to this company. We, we just couldn't, as you all know, as First Nations, we don't have that kind of money to pay, but definitely on our lands, our resources, our water, it, it, it is looked at as a value, but to us uh, as natives, uh, that's our livelihood. And that's one of the things we're doing now, working with the legal system, uh, with what we're hearing out, out uh, on the East Coast is uh, the modern uh, livelihood, what they're trying to implement. That is what we're working on now. So that way we, in the future, our, our uh, homeland owners that have cabins on their lands do not get 
uh, threatened by uh, MNR in the future. So these things being jailed, they had opened us, they had opened our eyes up uh, where we wanna document everything. Right now, uh, as we're all told, and the present presenters here too, as they said, it's our history is being passed down to generation to generation to generation. I agree with that. I like that. I have a lot of that. But when you go to the court system, it is not recognized. The judge would like to see, okay, what do I have to read? What do we have to discuss? What do I have to defend? So when you put those three together, uh, it, it means it's the system that we put forward into uh, has to have documentation. Oral history, we feel, is just not going to work now. So that's why uh, <clears throat> we're moving forward. Like we have quite a few policies and bills that we we uh, we got in place. Uh, the KI law, uh, our own laws, our own policies, our fishing, all these things. We're starting to implement those things. We even have our KI seal now. Any of our policies, we're starting to stamp them because we we want people, governments, to recognize there is a third government, and that third government is up north, which is us. And um, we, we don't want to go through or any other community we don't feel should go through what we went through, like getting harassed uh, when you have a, a police involved in your lands. But one thing that came out of it that they respected was when we asked any police with long rifles, we, we don't want them. We just want regular OPP officers with their sidearms. We, we don't want that extra stress having uh, people looking at you with uh, scopes or long rifles, none of that. And that, that, that is what we agreed to with the police and having them at our camps, being around us, knowing us, talking with them, it kind of uh, uh, brought uh, uh, the atmosphere down to a local level where they saw a lot of our elders be part of the process that this was just not the uh, uh, an organizational uh, concept of trying to disrupt a mining company's uh, uh, title to to a, a claim, and out of this too came uh, 200 uh, over 200,000 square kilometers of land put aside where no no mining activities will be, and it's giving us uh, the time, like I said, to come up with our own laws, our own policies, how we want to see our our our. Uh, land use documented areas. We went through the same thing as um, my colleague uh, Edward said. MNR would not fund us our land use documentation. They wanted nothing to do it because they knew what our plans were. They knew what it being jailed, what it triggered. It triggered us to be more uh, uh, not aggressive, but more uh, active in uh, pursuing our own laws, our own way of life, how we're going to protect our rivers, our lakes, and most importantly, our land. Not excluding the fact that we are working towards this vast land that we have. What, what will work with us to generate? Because we all know, as we view governmental structures, where do they get the money from? And I think uh, when, you, when, you, when we say that, it comes from uh, our resources. Uh, we can't turn back time. We cannot tell everybody go back to England. We cannot tell everybody go back where you came from because uh, we have to work together, live together. And how do we strive to make this thing work? What we want as our own governmental uh, policies to be recognized, to share in their resources, to share. And most importantly, as I said, this watershed declaration we did too. It's not just for KI. We're trying to protect whatever water we have for their overall population, uh, Ontario, and hopefully Canada. So that's, that's just where uh, we are, are all leaning towards as a, as a council here of KI. So that's just a short, uh, short uh, brief. And we do have a lot of these other Southern animals popping up too, as Edwards mentioned too. And we don't know how to eat those animals. 
Thanks, Chief, thanks, Chief Morris. Yeah. Um, uh, Sam, I see Sam is in the house. So, uh, Sam, would you like to say a few words about the Winnisk River? Yes, I, uh, as you all know, I've been uh, working with the, the community for the last couple of years. Um, I worked for a different organization before and uh, certainly met a lot of people throughout the years uh, from the federal governments, provincial governments. And uh, I tried to get um, the community to get started on, on the basics, the community-based monitoring so we can give them a voice because everybody's always been stuck with governments or under, under the governments without no say. And, uh, and I think that has been evolving through time. And with the work that I've been doing, I got for the last five years, I mean, the last couple of years, I accessed my own funding um, with the federal government. And this year I got three years funding, a total of about half a million for the work that I've been doing. So. And one of the things that I want to do is, uh, I know it may be a losing battle as usually that's how it works, but I wanted to save the, the watershed of the, the Winnisk River from the Pipestone. The Pipestone and the Winnisk River are basically the same river systems. And there is all, already a, a, one of the world's biggest dams of muscle white in, in, in the system. And, and I believe that uh, through the work and research in academia and universities that I've been working with, we managed to get our community trained. So we have the capability to determine if our water is clean. We know how to clean our own water now. We have uh, our own local people that were trained and so we have good clean drinking water. And I also study uh, the river systems, the creeks to understand how water works. We can still drink water up here and we have the knowledge to determine if our river system is uh, is contaminated. And we, the other two people I'm talking about, they, they know how to uh, work with our local plant and make sure we got good drinking water. But the important thing is the, uh, the our, not only the Winnes River, but also the uh, the the bay hudson bay we don't know what's going to happen because we understand with the the globalization of uh the world uh we hear stories that uh eventually they're gonna fish the hudson bay and a lot of the fish that go up river even the sturgeon they go out to the bay because that's what i study i study fish when they're small, we catch some out in the bay and eventually when they get bigger, they go up river. And uh, we don't know what's gonna happen if that ever happens. Um, one of the things I want to fight about in the future is to protect uh, at least uh, one river, Winnes River, because I think the other communities have been very quiet and uh, and I wanted to make a video this summer, but the partners that I created in the US and Ontario, uh, it's not gonna happen because of uh, COVID. But I think um, the importance of uh, at least protecting one river to me is very is very high on my, uh, my list. I've been talking about it for the last three, four years and um, all these developments that is happening People do not know what is happening behind boardrooms. I worked with the Ministry of Northern Neverland Mines, Queens Park, um, in the last several years, maybe five, six years ago. I worked with them for two years. And they're telling the people that uh, the Ring of Fire um, mining will last 100 years. But behind closed doors, they're, they're predicting uh, they might build a city in that area size of Timmins and the mining that might run four to 500 years. That's only the ring of fire. There's an old vault that runs across a really, really old tectonic plate in that area. There's a few more, a few more uh, dead volcanoes in that, in that area. And I think that uh, this information is not really, really out. And uh, our people need <coughs> clean drinking water 
And I know that the uh, the Aeropascat and uh, Egg One will be contaminated <clears throat> early in the process. I think uh, we're safe, our community is still safe for at least 50 years, but that's not counting a hydro, hydro dam. When I met with the federal government, I asked them where are they gonna get the power from? And they did not really answer my question. They just said at oh, the corridor and I don't know what the corridor means because it's not something that they they define and the uh, the amount of gravel that they will be taken out of the uh, the rivers where we are from the, from the headwaters I don't know what kind of contamination that's going to bring to our to our river because they're they're taking so much gravel from Winnesco's channel and uh, also the uh, Winnesco Lake Webquay area and also the other uh, small river systems up there. And it's a lot of uh, work and that's only just the, uh, the access road. And um, I think uh, the, the, the Winnes River is very fragile. I've tried to communicate with one and see what kind of uh, contaminants that they really have with the uh, with their fish, they don't really know because they, they they have not been trained, and also at Wabaska, they have not been trained. And the the Victor Mine was a good example because the uh, we're never trained how to water sample, how to um, study benthics, how to do fish sampling. So we we really need a, a regional strategy to uh, protect rivers because. I noticed that uh, where we used to go uh, catch sturgeon, a lot of them are really small now because a lot of, a lot of uh, I don't know how many inland communities are coming into our traditional area because we used to uh, have them as a delicacy. They were wiped out once before in the 1950s, not, all, not from uh, uh, inland communities, but from planes flying in up north and they just wiped them out and it's taken so many years for them to reproduce because that, that's how they, they are, the sturgeon it takes them like 30 years uh, to reproduce and now that they're reproducing, they're getting wiped out again. And uh, these are some of the things that uh, we need to talk about. And sometimes the government cannot step in because I talked to them about it because I've been doing a lot of uh, fish sampling up there. I'm going back again in July. And um, I think that uh, the Winnes River is, is something that I want to protect for future generations, not only for us, but for uh, recreational. It's one of the best rivers to canoe from all the way from Pickle Lake. And, I seen that since I was a, a kid, and uh, I know there are a lot of uh, stream gauges in that river because I canoed it down before from Pico Lake. I seen a lot of uh, boats from scientists, a lot of stream gauges. Stream gauges uh, usually indicate that there will be a hydro dam in the future. And I did see from Ministry of Northern Development and their 100 year uh, planning, they had at least seven dams in the lower, seven dams in the lower part of the Winnes River. And uh, just about every river in Ontario will be dammed as they do in uh, Manitoba. And uh, this is something that uh, we need to bring awareness on. I'm not anti-development, like everybody that has a computer, 16 of those minerals came from under the ground and glass came from on top of the ground. So uh, I don't think we can really say that uh, we should be anti everything if we're gonna drive a vehicle or use uh, communication devices, but we have to have medication. mitigation. And uh, with, with the, uh, the meetings that I had with uh, governments, mitigation, the terminology for mitigation right now is just giving uh, exploration companies to do whatever they want. If that word doesn't really fit for us or help us. We need to uh, bring uh, another definition for mitigation. 
it, sound, it sounds good, but it's not. It does not give us uh, any right. Uh, to give you a good example is that uh, when they started the, the Ring of Fire, uh, one of the companies that was affiliated with the fishing camp, we all know how they built that airstrip illegally. And now there's another cache of fuel on another site west of the Sutton. There's a lot of fuel there. And I, I'm very sure that company, mining company, exploration company, they don't have the the permits. They're all working illegally. And I can share those pictures uh, in the near future. This was just last year. I found, and uh, I'm the one that also found the illegal camp uh, north of the Egg One. I had it shut down um, because I saw it from the air. And um, we really need to work with these companies so we can find out what's really happening. Um, with the uh, community-based monitoring that I'm working with, with MNRF and MOECP and universities and um, Canada Wildlife um, and with Wildlands League, I think the transparency that we have is giving us the opportunity to understand what's happening in the process. And I think that uh, the importance of this is that uh, once you have transparency, we, you build partnerships, you build understanding, and, um, and everything seems to have uh, lifted especially after two weeks ago when they found the bodies of the, of the children at the uh, Kamloops. Um, I just did a four or five hour uh, Zoom meeting with the government this morning. And what we used to have, uh, lack of resources, lack of uh, equipment to do my work, all of a sudden that uh, those resources have become available and um, I think we need to create partnerships that does not butt heads with uh, um, companies and governments because the damage that was done in the past, we must understand that uh, that does not work. And that when you do the research on those kind of things, they will never work, they did not work those residential school stuff that happened, it happened in Europe. And, and I don't know why they bought it here. It didn't work here either. And uh, I think working together is good. We need a regional strategy. And I keep talking about a re regional strategy, but we have so many differences that people do not want to really work together. They have their own, chief and councils have their own agendas but we need a, a working group, a working team. We need a representative from the uh, achievement councils with the community champion to keep the work ongoing because some of these people will get elected out anyway, because uh, that's where one of the biggest problems are. Because with the governments, uh, even though they have uh, um, people that, uh, that they're out in the field, at least they're there, they don't change. You can still work with them. And uh, I think our differences can be, we should, uh, I should use the word mitigate here. We can work together, but we're not even trying. Um, as you know, Anna, I've talked about uh, regional strategy for a long time. I even presented to the uh, uh, Muskego Tribal Council. I've talked to Nan about it and what the political systems that we have. The problem is the chief and council is the highest form of government in the native area. And, and that's a big problem. We're all segregated. We are, we're just like little islands out in the field. And uh, it's, not, it, it's, it's not working. And I think we need to acknowledge that, work together. Because one of the things that's really important for me anyway, and I uh, voice this with the Ontario government, federal government, 
before should anything happen up here. We have to improve the quality of life for the people that live up here. That should be the first thing. And I think that we have to understand the people that live up here and every community members. Sometimes their voices never go past the chief and council. The chief and council, they wanna do what they think is good for the people. That's not the way it should work with the community-based monitoring system that we're trying to start in Piwana. It seems to work because the government started to listen and the people now seem to have a voice. They're going to the chief and council, chief and council working with the people is a give and take. And uh, the Ontario government is lis listening. And I think uh, we all need to have a regional strategy and uh, have a regional meeting because a lot of times uh, there is so many resolutions passed in meetings and they never get anywhere. We should just work with one item at a time in these uh, meetings. Anyway, I should stop there for now. Thank you, Sam. I was just texting Janet that it just, I feel like I'm on the river because that's what you sound like when you're on the river. I feel like I'm on the river with you. So there you go. Thank you for sharing you. that. Um, we're gonna hand it over to James and Connie and I know they have some questions. And uh, so take it away, James and Connie. Yeah, thank you to everybody. Um, that was really fantastic. And it's really great to hear, um, hear all those words and hear from you. The first question we had from the audience was for uh, Chief Donnie, which was, what are some of the main challenges that you have in protecting areas? Uh, the challenges we're facing today now is trying to understand uh, for example, when we hear the word carbon credits, trying to understand what does that mean? How can it benefit us when we hear there's monies behind that? And the other thing is uh, staffing. If we're going to operate as a government overlooking uh, our protected areas, we, we really need more staffing and funding and technology would be one thing. So those are the two things at the moment that uh, comes to mind. And the third one would be, uh, I did not realize that there are other communities of the same thought. So uh, when I look at the Meshkigwag, uh, there's an opportunity for us to work together as we have a department that's focused on protecting this, this uh, watershed, uh, the lands that puts is being put aside and being a watchdog for other outside entities not to come in. Uh, so that's another way of uh, uh, having a coalition of some of some sort to work with these uh, Mishkigwak uh, people that I, I'm in front of them trying to block everything from coming. If it gets past me, then they're there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> so that, that those are the three main things that I have uh, uh, that does open my eyes now. <clears throat> there, there, are, there are communities we can work with. I can delegate uh, my lands environment director to get in touch with these individuals, communities, and uh, how do we work together? So that way, uh, that's what I mean. Uh, these are the three things. But the two important things is uh, staffing, funding, and uh, trying to understand a lot of these things uh, that are popping up. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, for the answer, uh, Chief, and uh, uh, thank you all for our panelists in terms of your um, presentations and awards today. Uh, we did have an, another question from the audience for, for Edward. Um, I think you, Edward, introduced uh, southern species coming up to the northern part of the province. And I think our audience members wanted to learn a little bit more about how some of these invasive species were being managed. What do you do with these invasive species as they get more established in your territory? Is there a way to prevent it? How are you managing that? Well, that uh, uh, is Edward here responding. <clears throat> it's a very, it'll be very challenging to respond to uh, species moving 
because they have no boundaries, right? You can fly, swim. Uh, that's the, uh, we have no plans yet, but we're looking at developing plans how to hit to use the word that Sam said, uh, mitigate, <laughs> mitigate uh, from uh, southern species moving up north and then packing on uh, uh, breeding grounds. And that's, that's a challenge we have to face together. I have no definite answer, but it's very challenging. Thank you for that, Edward. It's certainly a, a challenge in, in many parts of the world in terms of control on invasive species once they've been established. Connie, I think you have a question. Um, so this next question is for Jackie, um, which is uh, you had just a beautiful presentation about um, the rivers and also the relationship to water. And I was just wondering what actions that you would want to see to protect the water or recover the water from some of the damage you've seen, or also just recover the relationship between the people and the water? Well, um, I guess um, I had the slide there of uh, women, like women need to be involved. Like I see in the presentation, there's one woman here. I'd like to see more and hear more women voices and um, the teachings like from the woman warriors you know that water being sacred and also for the process to be transparent and inclusive to both genders men and women i, I think that's important because by that also like i think one of the challenges um for our communities to working together uh, it's this colonial system has really divided up our nation and uh, the voice of women were also suppressed. And, uh, and I think, uh, and that's why it's really hard um, to do things. And I also based that from an experience from De Beers, when they were there, there was a massive sewer backup and my parents, they became homeless. They had this beautiful five bedroom townhouse and it got destroyed by the sewer backup. And there was no compensation from either the beers or from anybody. And then when I took it on the government level, it was um, invisible because they said before this happened with environmental assessment, it was in um, exploratory stages. Therefore, it does not, it's not official. So, you know, anything that exploration companies are doing, it's like, they're on their own, there's nothing illegal. They can go to a nearby community to dispose their sewer and destroy a home and there's no accountability, you know? And it was difficult to try to, as a citizen, as a member, to talk to chief and council and to the government, I was always told, talk to your chief and council, you know? So, and then it was the housing department and then, um, and, and from there, it's hard to listen to a woman's voice. So that, that's why a woman's voice is important because uh, we want to heal. We want to take care of our communities too. Because when we take care of our homes, our relationship, then we're also open to be more receptive of any resource projects happening in our communities. Otherwise, we're stuck and we're just drowning in our trauma, you know? So and uh, but and we know that everything is um, interrelated. The ecosystem, even now, there's a psychotherapist that now propagate that we should um, include nature, that we should start to appreciate the indigenous um, philosophy about our respect for nature, the equality we have with nature. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. That that does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jackie. Um, a, a question this time for, for Sam. Sam, thank you for, for sharing your experience in, in terms of community-based monitoring. And, uh, one question I think that we had uh, is, in you reference funding and the ability to get funding. Do you have any, I guess, tips or advice for other communities that are looking to expand their capacity in terms of being able to do uh, water monitoring in terms of accessing funding is, 
what in your experience would you share with others if they wanted to do something along what you've been able to accomplish? I think one of the things that is really important is uh, you have to have a, a good education and uh, and also to be a champion and to be, um, you have to have uh, a lot of heart of the environment that you live in. And you also have to have a really good plan, a really good uh, plan that in indicates what you will be doing with the, uh, the water, the peatlands, the permafrost. And also you have to have connections with the uh, universities. You have to have partnerships with the, uh, the governments uh, that you work with. You have to have all these things in place. Otherwise, if you do not have those partnerships, there's a good chance that you will not have uh, funding, access to funding. And that's very important because um, to give you an example, when we got that uh, funding, all of a sudden there's so much donations that are coming in for equipment, greenhouses, seeds, and all these things. And I think uh, we're not even getting started. We're not even outside the gate. And, and I think that is the most important thing. And uh, having uh, uh, partnerships with academia is the most important. That way you can train your, the people that you work with. Um, they can uh, continue the work. That's a key component. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate the answer and still me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, back over to you, Don. Um, so there's just another question from the audience. Um, and this one is for Chief Donnie again, but Edward might also be able to speak to it. But it was, um, will we have to start eating the invasive species? <laughs> so uh, it, was, it's, it was for Chief Donnie from the audience, but I think Edward could probably also speak to it with his discussion of invasive species. Okay. As we all know, Indians will eat anything that is killed. <laughs> no, that's uh, like, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, there is a wood duck we saw too. And we know uh, uh, it, is, it is under the protected species. So we, we are aware not to tackle that duck, but it's these other, uh, and I know in a neighboring community, uh, when he mentioned the raccoon, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who trapped a raccoon to uh, last winter, and he didn't know what it was too. So it it, it is it is coming. And I think uh, <clears throat> when you hear of uh, coyotes and raccoons, uh, cormorants and pelicans, which are uh, really creating. Uh, 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 whatever it is, if it's going to come up into our area, uh, th that is, uh, will happen. And I think, uh, myself thinking, uh, we have not really discussed it, but I think at some time, uh, if they're an invasive species, when you, when you hear of the carp being destroyed, uh, we ask ourselves, is that the way to go for us to, uh, eliminate these uh, invasive species? Or do we wait a few more years until something concrete can be planned with, uh, with, uh, with the government? Because uh, we do not know uh, where these species really originate from and how far originally they're supposed to be at. But now when you look at, when you look at them, uh, uh, even when I went to Seven River, I did see a, a, a large swarm of pelicans too diving. And I was just thinking to myself there too, uh, uh, what if they're catching a uh, miniature, I mean, small sturgeon uh, that are having a, a long time to mature. These are the things uh, I, I think of too. So right now it's just on our back minds. Uh, when are we gonna start tackling these species but we, we do not want to make a splash right now and uh, neg a negative splash, I mean, by uh, just going out there and uh, destroying um, nests on the island here in Big Trout Lake. If there are nesting, these comrades or uh, whatever, uh, we would rather wait and see later. And as uh, Sam Hunter says, uh, 
work with universities, see how we can deal with uh, with these invasive species at in the near future. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that James just had one last question for everybody, and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Um, unless we're out of time now, Anna. We're out of time. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But we will get your questions yeah. all answered. We will chase you down and we will get those questions answered post summit. I just want to thank you all. It's been um, amazing listening to you. This is the point was so that you could all elevate your voices. We wanted to share your voices and have them heard. So thank you for sharing your stories. I wish we had more time. Um, the next session starts at 2.30, so take a break. And please come back if you can. It's the Omish Gago land to see. So there's gonna be some similar themes in terms of peatlands, but also the bay. So thank you all, Miigwech, and uh, please come back in half an hour. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye.